In this video, we're going to apply the recursion theorem uh, and see what we can do with it. Here is the bottom line. Whenever we're specifying a Turing machine algorithm, then it's okay to say, obtain, via the recursion theorem, a description of this program itself, which we can denote as bracket, self bracket. We can write this as x gets a description of self. So what we're saying here is that this is a legal statement to say in any algorithm. Obtain a description of yourself and do something with it, such as store it in a variable x. This is a legal thing to say in any program, and that is the result of the recursion theorem. And so now, if we have this, we can now write our Quine program. Remember, it's a program that prints itself. Very simply, x gets self, print x. And the recursion theorem says that this program is an entirely legal program. It, there is a Turing machine that will implement this algorithm, algorithm. This is a computable algorithm. And the recursion theorem says that a statement like this where we are just saying obtain or get a description of the program itself is completely legal. Okay, now let's have some fun with the recursion theorem. Remember the acceptance problem for Turing machines. Given the description of a Turing machine and some string that's input to that Turing machine, does that Turing machine M accept that string? That's the acceptance problem, and we showed previously that it was undecidable, that really about the best we could do is just run M on W, and we've provided a proof of that. But now with the recursion theorem, we have a new, shorter, and I guess sweeter proof. So here's how it works. Assume that we have an algorithm call it H, that decides the acceptance problem for Turing machines. Assume that. This is a proof by contradiction. So now construct this machine B. What does machine B do? It takes as input some string W, okay, and it says get via the recursion theorem a description of B itself. So we know this is a legal statement, so we're assigning to x a description of machine B. And then we've assumed that we have a decider for the acceptance problem for Turing machines. So run B on W, sorry, run H on the description of B and W to see whether B would accept W or not. H is a decider, okay? If B will accept W, we H will accept. Okay? So then we do just the opposite. If H accepts, then we machine B will reject. Okay? And if H rejects, it means B does not accept W, then we accept. Okay? So here we have a machine B with input W. If H says B should accept W, then B rejects. If H says B should reject W, then we accept. So running B on input W does exactly the opposite of what H says B does. Therefore, H is wrong. So H cannot be deciding the acceptance problem for Turing machines. So that's a short, simple, and sweet proof that the acceptance problem for Turing machines is undecidable. Next, let's define the size of a Turing machine. We could define the size of a Turing machine in a number of ways. For example, the number of states, the number of transitions. Um, but one way we could decide, uh, define the size of a Turing machine is just to count the number of symbols in any description of the Turing machine. So the size of a Turing machine is basically the number of symbols in the description of the Turing machine. And given that we have a meaning for size, and, and that, that meaning will work just fine. Uh, we can say that a Turing machine is minimal if there's no Turing machine 
that's equivalent to M with a shorter description. So two Turing machines are equivalent if they do the same thing. And since we have a notion of size, one size could be one Turing machine could be smaller than the other one. And a Turing machine is said to be minimal if there's no other Turing machine that's equivalent to that Turing machine that has a shorter description. So that's a minimal Turing machine. And we can ask about the set of minimal Turing machines. As always, we present problems in the form of languages. So here's a language that is a set of strings called min TM. This is the set of minimal Turing machines. It's the set of descriptions of Turing machines where M is a description of a Turing machine and M is minimal. So what about this set? The set of all minimal Turing machines. It's not Turing recognizable. Interestingly enough, it's, it seems like maybe it's not that hard to imagine, the set of minimal Turing machines, but it turns out that it's, it's not Turing recognizable, which I think is perhaps somewhat counterintuitive, but it's really one of these complex sets that uh, we cannot even recognize whether something is minimal or not. And we're going to use the recursion theorem in the proof of this theorem. Okay, the set of minimal Turing machines is not Turing recognizable. And to prove that statement, we assume that the set is Turing recognizable. If a set is Turing recognizable, then there exists an enumerator for that. So let's call that enumerator E. Assume that then there must exist an enumerator E that will list out all minimal Turing machines under the assumption that the, that the set is Turing recognizable. So we're going to use this enumerator E to construct a new Turing machine C. We'll call it C. And here is what C looks like. C is a Turing machine. Okay. Um, it's got an input W. And what does it do? It obtains via the recursion theorem a description of itself. Okay, which we denote bracket C bracket. Okay, so the Turing machine C gets a description of itself as its first step. And then it's got built into it this enumerator that enumerates the set of all minimal Turing machines. And it runs E until it prints out a machine D that has a longer description than C. Okay, so it just keeps running the enumerator until it finally prints out some machine D, and we'll call it D, that has a longer description than C. And then what it does, C simulates D on string W. It just simulates D on W. Okay, so C does exactly what D would do when past W. Well, we assume that the set of minimal Turing machines is infinite since there are a number, an infinite number of uh, Turing machines, an infinite number of functions. So we'll eventually find a machine, D, which is longer than C. Okay, so we, We'll keep getting longer and longer Turing machines and eventually one of them will be longer than, than D. What C does is it simulates D. Okay, it does exactly what D does. Okay, takes his input, C takes his input W and it does exactly what D would do on W. Therefore, C and D are equivalent. Okay, C simulates D, therefore they're equivalent. We got D because D was listed out by the enumerator as one of the minimal Turing machines, but D is longer than C and C does the same thing. So there's a contradiction. So we've just proved that the set of minimal Turing machines is not Turing recognizable.